I'm Ryan Shadrick Wilson. Welcome to a, a full room. Uh, some of you might have been yesterday to a panel with some of the leaders from the biggest food companies on, on the globe. Right. You want to raise your hand if you saw them speak? Ah, a couple. Okay. Well, today it's more interesting anyway. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, today we have food investors and innovators who are inspiring a health revolution. And I might dare say that these are some of the folks that those big food company leaders are keeping their eyes on uh, quite carefully. With um, the food industry estimated to be about an $18 trillion industry from seed to fork, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in this space. We're seeing more and more interest and activity. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for social impact with these dollars. So today we have an esteemed panel. I'm going to try to quickly turn it over. On my far left here, Adam Wagley, the co-founder and co-CEO of Butterfly Equity. Patrick Smith, the co-founder founder and CEO of Power Supply. Uh, we have James Rogers, CEO and Science Director of Appeal Sciences. Kara Roll, co-founder and managing partner of VMG Partners and Arian Foster, former NFL player, now the founder of the Arian Foster Family Foundation and a food investor. Uh, okay, I'll get us started maybe with Adam and Kara because you've been investing in this industry for some time. It seems to, to a lot of us that the industry is under a tremendous amount of change. Can you speak to what you have seen over maybe the past decade in this space? Sure. I will jump in and then obviously jump in here and add color, I guess. Um, so I've been doing food investing since 2000, early 2000. Um, I think that's actually more of an evolution than a revolution, personally. Um, I've been doing this long enough to see that those trends build on one another. Mm. Um, I think one of the reasons why I love the lower middle market food space from an investing perspective is it's constantly about reimagining and improving the former paradigm. And so every new bar, new beverage, new food product, new snack should be better than the one that was yesterday. Why else would you be here um, if you're not moving forward and, and making progress? Um, I think some of the trends that I really appreciate now uh, that I think are super important and are reflected in, in my portfolio are all about nutrient density, using higher quality ingredients, sourcing more natural and organic ingredients, um, taking your time to put really quality food together uh, focus on gut health, I think, is really important. I think that's a trend, not a fad. Um, and I'm very privileged and honored to be able to support a lot of these brands who are, are really making change. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, great. From from our perspective, you know, we, we invest from, we call it seed to fork, so agriculture, aquaculture, food and beverage products, food retail and distribution, and restaurants and hospitality. And, and totally agree with Kara, it's been more of an evolution, but at the same time, it has become more of a system today than it's ever been before. Uh, probably the best example is, you know, a lots of the food companies in this country in particular were built in the 1950s and 60s around a manufacturing process, talking about delivering a food product at a cost uh, with not really much consideration for kind of what's in there. And today's customer wants to know what's in there, how is it made, how is it distributed. And so as systemic investors in food, we're excited that it is more of a system. It's more about vertical integration today than it's ever been before. Mm. Um, with a lot of fresh food in particular, it's about cold chain distribution. And so one of the things that uh, we, we thought when we went to form Butterfly was being a systemic investor in food is a very exciting way to look at things and help entrepreneurs really solve some of the problems that are kind of facing the space. And that's kind of what we're most excited about is that it's now a systemic approach that's required much more so than even 10, 20 years ago. And we find that really exciting. I will echo that point on transparency. There was a poll done recently that asked consumers what their number one purchase driver was in terms of product selection. Consumer packaged goods is what I do, so just to frame that as a reference point. Uh, transparency was 75% of those said it was their number one purchase driver. What's really interesting is for big CPG executives, only 40% of them identified that as an important point. Which I think is a really interesting disconnect and some commentary on kind of what's happening in food investing. And Can we today. say more what you mean by transparency? I mean, is it in the production? Is it in the it, It's nutrients? really about it's product ingredients, product quality yeah. in ingredients. If people want to know what's in their food. Everyone's reading labels. There's no question people are turning the product around on the shelves. But I think also understanding where it's coming from, that origin story is really important. And I think that's going to grow in importance yeah. as well. So you see, do you see that transparency sort of demand extending to the company itself? 
how the company is run. I do, so, I do. I think you've got to walk the talk. So if you're going to talk about how you're using better ingredients, I think you have to be a more transparent company. Yeah. All right, Erin, you're newer to this space. Took your hits on the field, now you're going to take your hits <laughs> in uh, investing. Hopefully um, not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you won't. Uh, do you want to say what attracted you to this food and nutrition and health space? Yeah, um, uh, it's it's kind of always been a, a, an interest and a, and a passion of mine um, because uh, growing up in the inner city, um, you don't really have means and access to healthy options. And so a lot of the big brands target that demographic. And so um, I, I wanted to do the best I could when I had an opportunity to have a platform, <clears throat> excuse me, is to um, provide healthy options uh, to kids, you know, not try to sponsor uh, drinks that are gonna, uh, mm. you know, dehydrate them and then and then add fat content to their diets. Like <laughs> I wanted to uh, kind of be an innovator in that sense, and so um, I got with so I have a lot of a really good team, and and um, we uh, we invest in a couple uh, a few companies that that do that and aid that, and so that's been our goal is to um, try to make money, but to do it in a way that uh, we're actually helping and not just consuming mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we call it we label it conscious capitalism mm -hmm. and when you look at potential investments through that lens does that mean you're looking for products that might resonate with the in the community where you grew up absolutely um, <clears throat> I think initially it's it's to it's to build your portfolio and then and then come back uh, um, but that's 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 definitely the end goal um, and it's, it doesn't just stop with our community it's it's, it's global like we have uh, this one company that 10% uh, of their profits go to uh, prenatal vitamins for pregnant women uh, in countries across the world, mm -hmm. and so that's really that's really the goal. Is like, of course you want to be profitable, but like I, I don't I don't want to just be a shark. I want to help people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Patrick, your company sits really at the intersection of several ma major macro trends in this space. Do you want to share sort of what those are and, and what you're up to with Power Supply? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Really, just kind of two major macro trends that um, feed our business, so to speak. One on the food side, and one on the health side. Um, you know, in food, we're seeing this massive mindset shift for millions of people, from a perspective of is there a pill for that to is there a food for that? And this is true for you know elite performance athletes who are trying to tweak their macronutrient input. It's true for a cancer patient who's trying to eat according to a ketogenic diet. It's true for a normal individual who just is trying to eat something that's unquestionably healthy. So that, um, that intentional eating is a really key trend um, that, that we're building the business on top of. On the health side, we're seeing this explosion of new fitness opportunities in the last five years, from CrossFit to SoulCycle to ClassPass. Across the board, there's millions of people that are trying to tap into their fitness in a whole new way. So we really fit at that intersection between those macro trends. So would you say that it's getting to the personalization of diet and food and nutrition? I mean, is that? Yeah, absolutely personalization. Um, I think fundamentally we're about you know, sustaining an individual's commitment to eating in the way that serves their health needs, which is a really freaking hard problem. <laughs> um, matter of fact, I can talk about our model a little bit, but I want to throw it to Arian real quick because um, you were a vegan for a while? I was. I was. Um, <clears throat> while you were playing football? While I, well, kind of. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I got really deep into the nutrition uh, space, and uh, I got so far down the rabbit hole that I went all the way to the end of the spectrum, which is uh, being vegan, or plant-based is what I like yeah. to call it better. Uh, and um, I really support the lifestyle. I love it. Um, but it just wasn't for me. Like, I couldn't... Um, I couldn't consciously make a decision every morning and every lunch and every dinner to, to be cognizant about my, my choices. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't have that in me, that discipline. So, like, I'm all for the lifestyle, but I just don't, uh, it's not for me, man. You're flexitarian. So, yeah, I'm flexitarian. flexitarian. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly the problem that we're trying to tap into, yeah. is it's really, really hard to eat according to an intentional choice yeah. for your diet. So, um, and there's really kind of two major problems that we have to solve for that. One is quality of the food and taste. Like it has to be just freaking really, really enjoyable. Healthy food should not be diametrically opposed to something that is enjoyable. <laughs> um, the, um, the other piece of this is that we need to provide a huge amount of variety. Um, 
you know, if you're going to sustain a commitment to eating well over time, you need to have a variety of options available for you. So we've taken a very different approach than central manufacturing, which is optimized for a few number of ingredients or a few um, quantity of SKUs at very high quality. <coughs> we have to optimize for a huge variety of SKUs at very high quality. So we're a marketplace platform. We work, we're in four markets, DC, LA, San Francisco, and Dallas. And in every market that we operate in, we have a network of professional, commercial, uh, professional chefs cooking out of commercial kitchens, making a small quantity of meals that they're really, really good at. But across the network of chefs, then we get a huge variety. And then on the supply side, we sell through health and wellness channels. That's gyms, yoga studios, health clubs, workplace wellness programs, and we have a partnership with a large healthcare provider too. Can you speak to a concern that Arian raised around accessibility? So right now, I love, I love your platform and your products and, and I'm fortunate to be able to afford them. Do you think we'll get to a place where more communities will have that sort of um, healthier option? Yeah, I affordable? mean, this is a deep um, uh, concern of mine and a driving passion. Um, the, uh, man, there's lots of different ways to answer that question, <laughs> but the short version is- I did not prep you for that at all. <laughs> <laughs> the short version of this is there's probably two or three things. One is we have a give back program now where a percentage of our sales go to local food access programs. Not just food access, but high quality food access. Um, the second thing is over the, um, the short to midterm, we really are focused on how can we drive our prices down to a place where they're much more affordable. Um, there's, we have a very clear path for what that looks like and it may involve um, subsidies or third party, third party payers. Um, but making it as accessible as possible, trying to get down to that three to four dollar price point per meal mm -hmm. for a you know a mm -hmm. segment of our sales is really really mm -hmm. important. Yeah. I would also throw in the aspect of convenience and availability. Yeah. I think affordability is clearly very important um, to everything that we're doing. But people need to have products available to them where they are yeah. um, because yep. people are snacking more often than they used to be, and they're really looking for meal replacement products. Um, so it's an interesting sort of segue into sort of consumer packaged goods versus in-home meals and sort of where they can help each other too because I actually think they can build on each other. Right. We spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about, you know, democratizing the access of kind of healthy choices to the, the broader uh, set of people out there and unfortunately, you know, it requires just a lot of capital to get to scale and so mm -hmm. one of the things we had, a, we had a food panel yesterday and we were talking a lot about how some great ideas in food are just going to take a very long time and a lot of money to actually become commercial and we kind of come to the market with that attitude so <laughs> knowing that we're probably going to put a lot of money into something that may be slightly more risky and kind of not see return for mm -hmm. a while just so that we can kind of get mm -hmm. access to a broader audience not because it's just the right thing to do but also because uh, we think that produces better returns over time mm -hmm. thinking about kind of a broader group like that and I do think there's a very important role for philanthropy as well in this I and mean, it's not going to just be the business side that kind of solves solves that equation so um, it, it's an interesting and, and complicated problem to tackle, but the good news is there's a lot of money in the world out there that, yeah. that's excited about this space. Do you want to share, are you in a place where you could share sort of how you're yeah. thinking about doing that with even just within your own company? Yeah, sure. So with Butterfly, you know, so we invest in, in food, uh, mostly for-profit companies to generate returns for our investors, but we've made the personal commitment to take 10% of all the profit we make as an investor and give it to something called the Butterfly Foundation that we've now formed. Uh, what's interesting is our 10% our mm -hmm. is meaningful, but the 501c3 is raising its own money, and we've been surprised at how much money it's actually been able to raise. So the, the, the focus of that foundation is both feeding people who can't afford to eat and getting people access to healthier food, you know, done in a purely nonprofit setting, but using a lot of the private, e private equity network and kind of relationships. So we're in the early days of doing all this, but we, we think by the end of the year, we'll be one of the bigger foundations in the country exclusively focused on food issues, which I think says more about just the fragmentation of philanthropy and, and kind of the role there. So we're kind of a different model from that perspective to Ryan's point early days of building it out, but we kind of acknowledge that this is not going to be only solved with a for-profit kind of model and are kind of putting our money where our mouth is, if, if you will. Mm. And uh, no pun intended around putting it where your mouth is, but um, <laughs> James, your company sets out to address, really, in my, in my perspective, one of the greatest challenges we have around the globe right now. Um, we share what, what appeal is for folks who don't know and I, and I don't know, do we have a video? Awesome. Great. You've got um, a little video if you need okay, it. Cool. Okay, cool. 
Um, so uh, when we think about what's you know going on, we talking about shifting from just calories to shifting towards more nutrient-rich uh, uh, energy sources. We think about that, and we think the main limit to um, to, to basically human nutrition is, is perishability of, of produce. And if we look around the planet, you know, the the loss numbers in the United States are staggering. You know, between a third and a half of the fresh produce that we're putting so much of our uh, land and energy into cultivating um, is is ultimately ending up in a landfill. And if you start to look at those losses in the develop in developing nations, uh, where you know the, we're not even beginning to address the nutrient issues, we're still addressing the, the calorie issues. Um, those losses can be even more staggering. You know, 80 to 90 percent of fresh produce that's that's harvested is ending up in a landfill, and it all comes down, uh, from our perspective, there to perishability. All fresh produce is seasonal, and all fresh produce is also perishable. Uh, and the result of that is that it's either feast or famine. Uh, you're either in season and you have more food than you could possibly consume, or you're out of season and uh, there, there's, there's nothing to eat. And so the way that uh, human or way that animals have, have solved this problem uh, is, is in some cases by migrating. Um, humans have solved this problem uh, by being able to transfer a perishable asset into a non-perishable asset, basically money. So, um, you know, in times of, of feast, uh, you're able to take that highly perishable asset, turn it into money uh, from the surplus, and then in the time of famine, you're able to turn that back into money, uh, sorry, back into food. Um, but in, in, in certain places of the world, uh, that, that's impossible, uh, basically because of lack uh, of access uh, to markets, uh, where you're actually able to turn that perishable asset into a non-perishable asset. And the reason that you, you lack those market linkages is because of the inherent perishability of the fresh produce. And what limits the, 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 the useful life or the marketable life of fresh produce uh, is its quality. Uh, we've, all, we've all seen the, the platters of strawberries sitting out there and you look at them and go, I'm not actually going to eat those. Those don't look very good. <laughs> and uh, what's happening basically is that as soon as the produce is harvested, it, it's kind of a ticking time bomb. Uh, the fruit has a certain number of breaths that it can take in its lifetime. And as soon as it's, it's basically taken all of those breaths, the, the food's really no longer palatable, palatable and it's now lost its nutrient density. And so the way that we've solved that problem in uh, the United States and other developed nations is that we've implemented this cold chain. Uh, we've built this uh, tremendous cold chain infrastructure, uh, which basically takes the produce from the field, immediately cools it down to within a hair of uh, freezing, and then holds that temperature throughout, uh, throughout packing, throughout warehousing, throughout distribution, all the way to the retail shelf, all the way to you at, at, at home as the consumer. Um, and we're very fortunate to have this system, but again, a, a third to a half of what we're growing is ultimately end up in a landfill, so it's not quite enough. And so what our company uh, has done is we've, we take uneaten plant material, so things like stems, leaves, scrape skins, orange pressings, whatever's left behind uh, or, or currently discarded on a farm, we blend those things up and from those blends, we extract subsets of very particular food molecules that we turn into a powder. Uh, so it's lightweight, it's low cost for us to distribute. You could think of something uh, like a sugar packet. Uh, we ship it to where we'd like to use it. Uh, we reconstitute it in liquid form, and then we dip fresh produce into that solution and we allow it to dry. And when it dries, it leaves behind this imperceptibly thin barrier of plant material on the outside of the produce. And that thin barrier acts to slow down the rate that water evaporates out of the produce and slow down the rate that oxygen gets in, thereby slowing down the rate that the, the fruit is respiring. And by doing that, we can dramatically extend the shelf life of most types of fresh produce by a factor of about two to five times. And the most important attribute of that is that we can do it uh, without refrigeration. And that means that we can begin develop, uh, developing supply chains uh, and creating market linkages in places of the world that traditionally don't have access uh, to those markets. Um, so it, they do have a video, I mean, it's, it's one thing for me to explain, it's quite another uh, to kind of see how it works. Uh, and so in the video that I think they'll queue up here on the left, you'll see untreated produce. On the right, you'll see produce treated with our solution. <coughs> we can add about five to seven extra days of yellow time on a banana, so you can start thinking about reducing spoilage in your home there. Uh, these are Haas avocados, the most popular commercial variety of avocados. We can get about two and a half to three times the useful shelf life of a Haas avocado, again, without refrigeration. 
Uh, green beans are incredibly visual, a very powerful demonstration of the technology. Uh, because the surface area to volume ratio is so high, they desiccate very rapidly, and our product is very effective at maintaining that moisture. Uh, these, are, these are mangoes, apple, apple, uh, apple mangoes, uh, and this is actually work that we did in conjunction with the Rockefeller Foundation in Nairobi, Kenya. We get about a 10 to 15 extra days of extension without refrigeration. Uh, tomatoes traditionally suffer from chilling injury, uh, means if you get them too cold they turn woolly and lose their flavor. Uh, so cooling them down actually further doesn't help, so our product's a way to do that. Um, I love the citrus example because one of the original ideas for the company was that fruit with a peel had a five times longer shelf life than fruit without a peel, and now fruit without a peel has a five times longer shelf life than fruit with a peel, which I think is really cute. Uh, the Fuerte avocados, you may not have seen these commercially because they traditionally have a very short shelf life. Mm -hmm. uh, with our product, we can get them to approach the shelf life of the, the Hassa variety. And then this is probably the one we're all most familiar with uh, seeing in our refrigerator. Uh, strawberries are incredibly visual and there's an attribute like this for all kinds of fresh produce. Once you lose about 6% of the mass of a uh, strawberry, you open up these little surface fissures on the outside of the produce and those are the areas of ingress for bacteria and fungi and at that point it's game over. So it's j there's no fungicide applied, it's just by maintaining the natural health of the fruit or vegetable longer, it's able to better resist those biotic stressors. So um, that, that, that's uh, how we view the problem and, and how we're trying to solve it. So I love this. This wow. looks amazing. <laughs> I'm just envisioning you hand dipping the strawberries though in your polymer, <laughs> your, your, yeah. your barrier. How affordable and how scalable is that? Yeah, so, uh, so we recently, uh, so, so our company's been in existence for about five, five and a half years now. Uh, we've been financed for about the last three and a half years. Uh, and so our team of about 75 scientists and engineers in Santa Barbara, California, spent the last uh, three and a half years of financing and about $10 million developing this technology to get it to a point where we were able to make it uh, as affordable to smallholder farmers in the developing world. Uh, the product's uh, currently in use in Kenya and Nigeria uh, at prices that, that smallholder farmers can afford. Um, and the, the, we just in November raised a $33 million round of financing uh, basically to bridge the gap between uh, what we've manufactured uh, in the U.S. and uh, delivering it to, to customers at scale. And so uh, your, your point, is, point is well taken uh, that you, you really don't want to add more label, labor to the situation where you have people individually dipping strawberries. And so hmm. while it's very valuable to demonstrate the power of the technology on highly perishable items like strawberries, the way we view the world and we, the way we divide the produce industry is according to whether the fruit is uh, considered to be shed packed or considered to be field packed. Mm -hmm. Shed packed produce basically being all of that that's harvested in a bin and treated on it can go through a conveyor system where it's sized and sorted uh, traditionally and field packed being that's that which is picked in the field directly into a clamshell. So when I got into this business, uh, bl believe it or not, I, had I knew nothing about the fresh produce industry. In fact, I called my mom and told her I was thinking about leaving my PhD to start this company, and she said, that sounds nice, sweetie, but you don't know anything about fresh produce. And that was not what I needed to hear, but uh, she was uh, completely correct uh, in that I thought the best use of the technology would be for strawberries and went out and observed people harvesting the fields and saw that they were directly picking the strawberries immediately into the clamshell. And where in this process could we possibly apply our product? And so. Uh, we have now developed application systems for, for doing treatment uh, in field. Uh, that's a little bit further down the road for us. Uh, commercially right now, again, we're focused mostly on those shed-packed varieties of fresh produce, uh, things like avocados, uh, mangoes, tomatoes, apples, uh, even bananas in some situations. Uh, so, so we really break and segment the market into you know, shed-packed varieties versus field-packed, mm -hmm. and we're really trying to just take, take over the, uh, the shed-packed varieties right now. Given the potential impact on, I don't know, world hunger that this could have, and uh, you know, minimizing post-harvest loss, did you have a moment at the beginning where you considered doing this as a non-profit organization instead of as a corporation? The, the, the thought definitely uh, crossed my mind, but mostly from the perspective of, you know, very. For, I, I believe that in a science-based business, it's often hard to get off the ground because people go, yeah, sure, if you can solve world hunger, that's going to be a profitable endeavor, but you know, how the hell am I going to prove whether or not you're able to do it scientifically? Yeah. Um, and so getting that, that first initial capital um, from, getting that, that first capital I think is, is often the, the hardest trick in getting a science-based business <laughs> off the ground. And so, uh, you know, we considered it from the perspective of here's an opportunity to uh, raise philanthropic dollars to be able to go solve this, this technical challenge. Um, but philosophically, uh, you know, my, my view is that 
uh, the way that we're going to improve the livelihoods of people around the world is not through aid. Uh, it's going to be through economic empowerment uh, of, of these diverse populations. And in order to facilitate that, uh, what we need to do is not uh, is not not provide aid or not go give training, uh, but rather to to uh, install something uh, that we think of as akin to basically infrastructure. Um, you know, right now, if you think about what limits perishability, right, is the distance between where the produce is grown and where the market will be willing to pay for that produce. And if you have a highly functioning road, uh, well, between those two places, mm -hmm. uh, you can you can you can sell your produce. But the problem is, if you don't have a, a good road, then you you can't sell your produce. And so, if we think about being able to distribute these uh, little packets of our material to remote locations, and double, triple, or quadruple the shelf life of that piece of produce. It's almost like you double, triple, or quadruple the speed that you're able to travel mm -hmm. on that road to create those market linkages. And so we don't think of uh, our company as doing uh, philanthropic work so much as we do uh, think of it as investing uh, in infrastructure, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a new, new kind of infrastructure in particular places on the planet. And so from that perspective, uh, we never really looked at it as, as truly philanthropy, but really needing it to be a sustainable business to, to endure. It, it, there's an interesting thread that's come out in this conversation that was unintentional, but from the Conscious Capitalism, Butterfly Foundation, to what you were saying, Patrick, about your hopes long term for the company, this, this real strong social impact uh, across everybody here. Is, is the food industry, because what it is, just inherently a social impact endeavor? Um, I feel like there's certainly more B Corps in the food industry than you see in other you know, industries. But what's your, as an investor, <laughs> what's your take on? B Corps and sort of this infusion of cause and, and business. Yeah, um, so my good friend and the founder of Kind, Daniel Lebetsky, said he was a business that was not only for profit. And I thought that summed mm -hmm. up how I think about mm -hmm. social mission and the intersection of investment quite well. Mm -hmm. um, I think B Corp is a great framework once you have the basic strategy of your business established to continue to improve. It is not on my top 10 things to do in my 100 day plan. Um, I think it's fabulous. I'm glad it's there. Yeah. It's a great framework. Mm -hmm. um, but you got to figure out your strategy before yeah. you can figure out your B Corp. So I would never let the tail wag the dog. Yeah, my opinion. Yeah, could, couldn't agree more. I, I think, you know, to, to attract the capital, uh, like you were saying initially, I think you do have to have something that's kind of commercially viable. So totally agree with Kara on that point. And we spent a lot of time looking at B Corps and, you know, ESG matters and things like that. But yeah. I would agree, Ryan, that it is kind of a social matter. Yeah. I mean, food companies are not only feeding people, but they're also the biggest employers in this country by far, you know, oftentimes the, the people that are going paycheck to paycheck. And so when we look at these businesses, you can't help but ignore yeah. a lot of these things. And I do think it'll require kind of collaboration across a lot of different parts of this. So, you know, technology and science, to your point. I think it's a big part of it. I think a lot of capital is required <coughs> because mm -hmm. of the supply chain issues mm -hmm. uh, that you were talking about. And um, but you know, profit first. I mean, that's how you're going to attract the money in the first place. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just just to dive in there. I mean, quickly. I, I'm always. I, Coming, I uh, was, was not in the food industry at all. I, I did my uh, my graduate school work studying flexible plastic solar panels. <laughs> kind of far off, um, <laughs> and I'm I'm fascinated now as as I'm having the opportunity to travel to to different geographies uh, where we're beginning to do work, um, to really see uh, where economic value is generated. Um, I mean, if you if you really trace back, you know what's going on in the food system. You're going from uh, basically the, the closest thing to free inputs on the planet uh, possible, right? Sunlight, um, potentially just seed that has self-propagated from the year prior, um, and, and water, which is widely available in most places except for California. Um, <laughs> and then what you're doing the, in, in the classic economic model is you, your in, one of your inputs is labor, and your labor cost is associated with you know, what, what produce you're harvesting. And, you can almost calculate based on the daily wage uh, that, that these folks are, are earning and the fuel cost what the ultimate price is going to be in the market of that fresh produce. So if you think about the connection between the market price that something's going to receive in Europe and uh, the, the cost of labor in Kenya, those things are directly uh, linked with each other. And, and I think that being able to improve the quality or reduce losses uh, or widen distribution, uh, or or get more consumers purchasing, you know, a, a particular uh, CPG good. Um, those things directly impact uh, the, those small farmers uh, around the globe. So I think that the, the food system is the most clear connection uh, between 
uh, people's livelihoods and something that we all experience every day. Yeah. Ryan, I think saying that because you're in the food business, you're going to have social impact is like saying because you're in the energy business, you're going to have social impact. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can have significant social impact if you're intentional about it. Right. And it's from <coughs> supplier to distributor to manufacturer to, you know, ultimate sale, uh, point of sale. Um, and we've had to become, you know, expert at being intentional across that entire stack. Um, the question of B Corp is really interesting. Um, we looked at that about four years ago. We were incorporated as a C Corp. Um, because of the strong mission alignment, we considered it um, pretty significantly, decided against it for a couple reasons. One was traditional financial institutions and investors didn't quite know what to make of it. That may have changed over the last four years, but that was the case then. And we saw another model that we thought was potentially better. Um, I like to think of it as the honest T model, which is a combination of third party certification and external commitments to your, your stakeholders. Um, and so we rely on a third party certification called the real certification, um, which is a standard of sustainable um, sourcing and high quality ingredients on the one hand. And then we make external commitments like the give back program that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, I really like the concept of not only for profit because we're really trying to do the two step that yeah. Arian mentioned of how do you build a highly profitable, high growth business and at the same time be intentional about impact. Yeah. Arian, do you think, I know this is a newer space, do you think we'll see more from you in, in, in the food and nutrition yeah, um, absolutely. investment yeah. world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> just like I said, uh, you guys talk about social impact, I think you're going to have it either way. You're going to only have social impact in the food space. It's either going to be positive or it's going to be yeah. negative. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, <laughs> so I think, <laughs> so I think, I think you just have to align yourself. And as we're growing as a society, <clears throat> we're, we're, we live in a great time. We live in the information age. You have the world at your fingertips. And so people are starting to become more aware, more cognizant of what they're putting in their bodies. And that's why you see these revolutions or evolutions. Yeah. Um, you, you're starting to see the boom of it, and it's just going to continue to grow because as information spreads, people start to soak that in. Yeah. So, like, you always want to be a part of that yeah. that growth instead of the hindrance. And you know, it's quite meaningful. It's caring from my previous work, but sort of it's trying to inspire kids to make changes. But to see people like you right. saying these things and sort of investing your values is 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 really meaningful. I'm going to open up to folks here for questions because I can see it in eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, and there is a <coughs> mic coming. Yeah. Uh, just the whole panel. I, I'm totally inspired. I, I really appreciate all the work you're doing. But I have a question for you, James. I'm, I'm a food microbiologist from uh, the Milken Institute School of Public Health. All right. And, uh, and one of the things I worry about about the field packing, dipping packing, is maybe sealing pathogens. Big time. In there. And so does this wash back off, or is it more like wax on an apple? Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a really important point, um, and that you know, we should be thinking about this all the time, actually. You know, I think the, the microbiome of human beings is, has been really brought into vogue recently, but there's a plant microbiome uh, in the same way, and some of those pathogens uh, are pathogenic, and some of them are non-pathogenic uh, towards humans anyways. Um, and so <clears throat> we're always very concerned about thinking about how uh, potentially pathogenic uh, sources could come in contact with any, any type of food. The current situation as it is now uh, is a, 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 a skilled worker uh, out in the field uh, mm -hmm. picking those pieces of produce, packing them directly into the clamshell, and then never being touched again until they're at home, you as the consumer. And so we actually think in, in some of those field packing situations, our product is an opportunity to add a sanitization step into that process. And so we've actually found ways uh, to include in our delivery solutions a small amount of ethanol, which is uh, drinking alcohol, basically. That's, that's the same way that a doctor would sterilize their hands to go into uh, an operation. And you can include a small amount of that into the delivery solution to completely kill any sort of uh, pathogen that would have gotten in there in the field. Um, the reason that we don't do that normally uh, is because that ethanol uh, would normally uh, irreparably damage the produce and there would be no way then to, to, to sell it. Um, so with our solutions, we can both sterilize the product by including a small amount of delivery solution 
and then more than repair the damage to the surface so that we still get the extended shelf life. So I actually view it as an opportunity uh, to improve food safety in, in lots of these uh, field-packed situations where there is currently no uh, sterilization step happening. Dr. Heber? Oh, yeah. Um, very interesting about the intentional eating and how we keep people in intentional okay. eating, how foods have to taste good. Um, Research at the University of Connecticut say we make about 200 unconscious food decisions <laughs> per day. The, the food it. enters our mouth without even thinking about it. And the food industry, and not this panel, but another panel, is kind of complicit in that. And they discovered something called the bliss point, which is 10% sugar by weight, 20% fat by weight. And, oh, you got that great protein bar. Now let's put some more sugar in it and sell it. So I think there's a, a, there, is a, there are very great technologies now available to do exactly what you're saying. And um, I wonder if you want to comment about nutrient density and also the need to emphasize protein, because protein is probably the most satiating macronutrient, the one that addresses the global obesity epidemic. And yet, you know, fruits and vegetables, I'm a huge fan of that as well. Uh, the issue is many of the produce manufacturers don't produce produce for phytonutrient content. They produce it for how many heads of lettuce can I get into a box? And so I think there's some elements here for several of you to really innovate and improve the food supply. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I heard a great phrase recently that um, carbohydrates are the macronutrient of convenience. <laughs> and if you think about the entire food system, it's really been built on top of the margin that you can drive from cheap um, food product prim primarily built around carbs. And so a lot of the innovation that you see in the food space is around protein. All the alternative proteins that you see from Memphis meats to cricket protein to new you know, um, vegetarian protein. Um, and for us, um, we're talking about very nutrient dense meals and that really the economics don't work for us to go through traditional retail channels. So that's why we've had to go direct to consumer. So all of those things are on point for us for sure. Yeah, and the, the comment I'll add there as well is one of the other attributes is, uh, we think about this all the time for produce, is the aesthetics of the fresh produce. If it doesn't look good, people don't eat it. And, 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 and the industry has latched onto this, and actually, if you look at the breeding programs for most kinds of traditional produce that you have on your plates, um, when they're breeding that produce, the number one thing on that list is transportability. It's not mm. flavor, it's not nutrition. Um, you know, those are down, you know, nutrition might not even be on the list, mm -hmm. uh, flavors on there somewhere. Um, and because of this perishability, um, what they'll do is they're optimizing for the look of the fresh produce. And so the example that, you know, I like to give often is that, uh, you know, everyone complains often that their tomatoes don't taste like anything uh, or they, they taste like water. And the reason for this is actually uh, because they want the produce to look good on the shelf. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll harvest that tomato at a color index of three, which probably doesn't mean anything other than to say they harvest it when it's green. And the consumer really wants to consume that tomato when it looks like a color index of about five to, to five and a half, basically when it's that deep dark red. But because as soon as you harvest the produce, uh, you, it's going to continue maturing uh, during transport, you're picking it at that color stage three and you're delivering it and so it'll be a five when it reaches the store. Well, the problem with that is, is that uh, the, the fruit itself is just a storage vesicle for the nutrition that's generated by the leaves, which are the factories of the plant. And so as soon as you disconnect the fruit from that factory, you're no longer getting the nutrient development inside of that piece of fruit. And so if you look at lycopene levels, for example, of a, of a tomato that's harvested at a, a three versus a five, they're only a third of the level that they would achieve. That last day and a half of ripening is when basically all the, a lot of these nutrients are getting stockpiled into this piece of produce. And so just by changing the harvest practices and reducing the perishability of the produce so that you can harvest closer to a color stage five, you can get a tomato on the market that actually looks good and has triple the nutrient density that it was otherwise. And I just don't think that this has been something that consumers have even thought about until now. And so yeah. talking about people looking at the label, I don't think it's going to be long before people are looking at the label on the produce itself and wondering, you know, what is the true lycopene content in this yep. particular piece of produce? Yep. I will say, you know, Ari and I are invested in a company called Healthware, which is a seed-based business. It's mm -hmm. a superfood business uh, that the original product was chia seeds. And so what we're trying to focus on are what are those power ingredients? What are those hard to find but nutrient-dense ingredients that you can put into convenient format so people can eat real food and feel good about it? Um, I don't know if you want to comment on why you thought Healthware was so exciting, but I know that 
was a really important message for me. All right, uh, <clears throat> first I gotta say, as a tomato consumer, I didn't know any of that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, Health Warrior was, was initially um, uh, intriguing to me. Uh, first of all, because of the people behind the product. Uh, the, uh, Shane Emmett is one of the most awesome people you could ever meet. Um, but um, Chia, Chia was kind of a new thing, and it's kind of a fad now. And um, this is, it's a superfood that the story behind the chia seed, I won't spoil it for you, but it, it, it goes into like how the natives used to use it and they used to run forever and it helped them. Like it's just a really intriguing story, so I encourage you to look it up. But um, so that, that, that initial uh, um, story brought me into it and then just meeting the people of the, of the, of the company. I, I believe, I'm a strong believer in people and the why of what they do and their why fit my why. And so mm -hmm. that, was, that was initially it. I like that. But like seeds are really a, a power source, right, yes. of food. So if you think about kind of at the very core of all food, yeah. you know, seeds really are where you find the epicenter of nutrition. I think having an opportunity to invest mm -hmm. behind those types of brands that are, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would call it a fad, I would disagree with you on that, but I think at the very, you know, front edge of how we're thinking about nutrition, those are the kinds of things I get excited about investing in. Yep. I love that phrase, their why matched my why. Yes. Yeah, that's that's very much, I if we're talking about investor again. company fit, like that's like the source. That's <laughs> <laughs> just like the source. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send the royalties. Um, so we, we have a question up front. So speaking of protein, there, are, there seems to be a growing number of startups um, uh, creating foods, looking at alternatives, alternative sources of protein, whether it's a burger that looks like a burger but comes from peas or, or eggless mayo. Do you see this as a fad or maybe a California fad? Do you think this is a growing trend that's here to stay? And looking at developing nations, is this a, a kind of science, food science, that could benefit them? Yeah. Uh, and is there a demand? So, so lots of comments here. I think, I think if you just look across the board and you look at the way that GDP trends with, with protein consumption, uh, there's there's no argument that uh, as people become more wealthy, they like they, they choose to consume more protein, and so we're going to have to address that in, in in some way. I think Adam actually might have. I, I I think one of the really exciting ways that we might be able to do this is through aquaculture, and I think Adam's been doing some cool stuff in that space. I don't know if he's able to comment. Yeah, no, great. So aquaculture is uh, something we spend a lot of time on. I mean, it's already the biggest kind of protein out there between wildcat and aquaculture, and we look at. That's an industry that's grown 14x in, in the last you know 20 years or what have you, and so we're spending a lot of time on you know what are the opportunities there as a protein. I mean everyone in this room is eating a lot more fish than they did before, yet we're still eating a lot less fish in the rest of the world. And aquaculture is really the only way to kind of solve that. So we've made one bet there in something very exciting around kind of striped bass, but we're looking at a platform to kind of go consolidate around that. And I know fish farming has you know, some mixed perspectives, you know, on land versus, versus ocean rays. You know, we spend a lot of time on ocean rays because we think it's more sustainable and actually kind of has a lot of, a lot of better aspects kind of about it. So, um, so that's kind of on the aquaculture side. On the, the protein question directly, you know, we're not smart enough. Uh, there's a lot of scientists in the room here who are trying to figure out how to, how to do this. We're actually big believers in it, though. We think it's a huge you know, problem to be solved. I think it's going to take a lot of capital. I think it's going to take a lot of patience. Um, and it's a little bit early for us to kind of make a play, but we're spending a lot of time studying it because it would be, um, t to your point, you know, people want to eat what they like and, and people like the taste of meat. You know, the, the panel we had yesterday kind of brought that to life. So the more the science can evolve to getting that right, we're big believers that that will be a big space, uh, but there's going to be some winners and some losers, so we're kind of cautiously approaching that. And we think the winners are actually going to be the ones that have the great idea, but actually more importantly have the access to capital to outlast uh, what it's going to take to kind of make it happen. So um, again, we think it's an exciting space, but I think it's early for us. I think we're in the middle of a protein craze, personally. I think we've gone a little crazy when there's protein in my pancakes. I have to ask, you know, have we gone too far? Um, I'm a big believer in real sources of protein, um, not engineered sources of protein. I think that's, that's sort of relevant. I think it also has to be a balanced, nutritious product. So there's also fiber and omega-3s and um, a variety of other nutrients that we should be looking for in our daily diet. So it can't just all be about protein, would be my perspective. I would say though that there's a lot of the concerns around protein sources, general animal proteins, are related to sustainability concerns. Absolutely, and, and that's an um, issue we have to And that's address. one of the reasons why I'm yeah. personally very excited about some of the new yeah. protein sources. Um, as an e-commerce marketplace, you know we're much we're very close to customer trends and trying to map to those. 
Um, and I'm excited to try to get some of the alternative proteins, cricket flour being one of them, into our product um, and gauge consumer response to that. So I was an early investor in Vega, which was a vegan product when it was launched as a whole food health Not optimizer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the hardest thing about these alternative protein businesses are taste. Yeah. So back to the original yep. premise of it has to taste yeah. good. Yep. There's still work to be done. It's yeah. The technology is getting better and better, which is great for those who are seeking a non-meat-based diet. Yep. So. Yeah, I think the taste thing is really interesting because we only really sensing five uh, tastes. The rest of it are, are aromatic, so hmm. I think that there's really interesting games, and I think that some of the alternative meat companies are actually looking at uh, looking at ways to, to play the play those. Could tricks. you break that down for uh, all the simple-minded people in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 we all know it, right? You, you know, you can only taste like salt, like salty, sour, right? right? Like the, the the five like sweet, right? We can all name yeah. them. Right. Um, but the, the, a lot of the the flavor attributes actually come from the the aromatics. They come from the things you can smell, the volatiles. If you will, so this is for y'all that didn't know. That. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if you plug your nose when you eat, it doesn't. Yeah, it's yeah general, right. Yeah. That's the way you used to eat, that's the way you used to eat as a kid, right? Plug yeah. your nose plug and your you nose don't taste, taste it, it, right? Um, so, so, so there's. I think there's some interesting, interesting games that you, that you can play there, and then, you know, once you figure out how to make it, it you know, argue, taste, you know, or basically have the, the mm -hmm. appropriate sensory experience of the protein, then I think it really comes down to figuring out what's the most effective organism at turning calorie, turning a calorie into protein. And at a really, really, really high kind of, you know, creepy level, you know, insects in some ways are like little robots that are good at seeking out a food source and turning it into a protein which allows them to perform their function. Mm -hmm. And you could take that across scales and you could look at, you know, what's the efficient, you know, what's the efficiency of a, you know, a, a cow robot, you know, wandering around eating grass versus a fish swimming around, you know, grabbing stuff out of the water. And you could actually break it down and look systematically at, you know, if you're still going to use a living system to do that, what would be the most efficient? <coughs> you could go all the way down to, you know, fungus or bacterial level. Um, and I'm sure that some of these alternative protein companies have, have done these calculations and if not they, they should because it'd be a cool graph. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yeah, hi. Um, is this on? I can't tell. Yep. Yeah. So um, this is all really exciting but what concerns me is that we have um, a movement now to roll back nutrition standards in schools and to generally create a less educated generation. Um, and an understanding and an awareness and uh, knowledge of how to look for and how to enjoy how to eat, how to prepare, how to cook nutritious food is critical to your market being viable. What do you see as your role in ensuring that there is that education and that we don't roll back those standards so that kids are coming out now who don't have any awareness of what it is to eat healthy? Hmm. Maybe well, I can comment. Um, we're on the board of something called The Kitchen, which is uh, a restaurant company founded by Kimball Musk, um, Elon's brother, and it's a for-profit casual dining restaurant, effectively, that's trying to take aim at a lot of the kind of mass-produced casual dining chains that are out there, so it's a great idea in and of itself, but one of the reasons we decided to back him is he takes a certain percentage of the income he makes on the for-profit restaurants to install learning gardens, and at this point has installed, I think, just over 300 of these uh, throughout the country, and when you look at the test scores and kind of the happiness levels of the kids that are learning how to actually grow these things, they have a greater propensity to eat that way. And it's one example of a company that we found that's really kind of tackling it. But I do think it starts with, you know, our kids kind of learning more about what they need to be eating and getting excited about being part of that, being, being part of creating that. And what I'm optimistic about too is that I think consumers are getting way better information today than they ever have before. And that'll continue to be the case And <coughs> as an investor we need to know where consumers are going, but consumers are going to be going more in this direction. We don't, we don't think it's a fad. We think the information is kind of getting better. I think the access point that Ryan talks about is making sure that it's at price points that everybody can get it um, is, is a very important part of that. But we're, we're optimistic about basically people, people learning more and getting better, and, and the kids are obviously at the centerpiece of this. What I would say is there's definitely um, societal trends that are concerning, but I don't think nutrition illiteracy is a new thing. Um, before I started paying attention to my own health, I had no idea what the difference was between the different macronutrients. Like, I was freaking clueless. Um, and so, personally, what we're doing as a company, I view as core to, you know, th there's education built into our product about the composition of the food and the nutritional um, components of that. So, 
um, it's a you know very important thing that we're doing. I think nutritional literacy in general is something that really needs some philanthropic phil philanthropic focus. Yeah, Say that ten times fast. Hard hard to do. And just real briefly, I, I think it goes 100% back to what Adam said. I, it can, it, once you see how the produce is produced and what it ultimately ends up with on your plate, you can't unsee that. And I, I, you know, I think we've all heard of STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I've recently heard it called STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, uh, agriculture, and ma mathematics. If you think about, you know, really our core fundamental connection to the earth, uh, it, it's currently with with agriculture, and, and probably will be for a very long time because it's th that's how we generate the calories that that actually sustain us. So. Uh, I think that, that those type, supporting those, those types of programs and not just science, techni technology, engineering, mathematics, but also agriculture as well, uh, create those connections, uh, which, which are not only going to help inform students about nutrition, uh, but also going to help with, with issues related to sustainability uh, and, and the environment. Um, you know, I think as a kid, you could just see, oh, this, this is a Fruit Loop. It's made from flour you know, or, or cornmeal or whatever. And it, as soon as you go see how that corn is actually produced and then pounded and then refined and then you're like, oh, that, that actually was a plant at some point. And, and I don't think you can unknow that. And mm -hmm. I think once you create that link, a lot of the problems, um, you know, you're going the right direction. It's an interesting question because really we can do all the education we want. And education sort of gets us so far with kids. But when culturally what they're seeing yeah. is completely conflicting messages and I would maybe come back and we this is completely off topic for what we talked about before coming into to this Arian but um, when kids were watching you play mm -hmm. um, they would see your colleagues in ads mostly for sugar sweetened beverages right. some of the least healthy things that's what we see in TV ads and then the banners all around the stadium for mm -hmm. the products that are probably not what you and your teammates were f fueling your bodies with? No, not at all. Um, so, <laughs> just the moderator, but I'll get a little opinion in. Yeah, no, I've, um, I've, I've always been but, it. but do you do any speaking to kids now? And is there a way that you're conveying sort of the lifestyle you live to those kids who look up to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I do. Like, I, all I could do is control me. Like, I know, uh, especially in the sports industry, it's such a big marketing business. And so you got guys uh, getting suspended a year for smoking marijuana, but they got Budweiser signs all over the state. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just a, a huge hypocrisy. Yeah. Like McDonald's uh, s um, supporting athletes, is this, it's so twisted. Um, <laughs> but um, I think education is always going to be the number one driving uh, force to any progression in this country, period, or any, in any, any walk of, of life. Um, but it's like he, he was saying earlier, is, is the infrastructure. Like we have to find a way to get accessibility um, and, and quality product to kids. Uh, and that education process is the under, underlying most important factor. And, and I, I feel like I, I did my part as, a, as an athlete. <clears throat> and all I can do is help inspire other athletes. But it's really the consumer, right? So like when I was growing up, like there was no um, vegan options or vegetarian options or uh, there's there was none of this growing up but like as the consumer wants the consumer gets and us, uh, and the more we educate ourselves the the more the the company is going to say okay well they're not really buying double cheeseburgers anymore like, <laughs> it's you know, supply and demand we, yeah it's it's basic economics so it it's is. like i have i have to um, i have to continue to do my part and i if you want to change the world change man and mirror it's extremely corny but it's it's very <laughs> truthful yeah, yeah. We have one more Hi, question. Yeah, I'm Jonathan Smiga with King Growth Capital. First, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Ryan for curating such a great panel. It's fantastic. Um, My question's a little more uh, in a slightly different direction, more around CPG products. You know, the Mintel report said recently that 10% of the population will eat the conventional three meals a day, and the other 90 are eating some version of micro meals combined with snacking. And as a gentleman, or I think it was a gentleman said that, you know, it's a mindless exercise snack. <coughs> so on the one hand, it's easy to go to the value-added functional products, whether it's a, a chia product or probiotics or protein enriched. What is your view and interest in uh, free from, you know, the, the other mm. side of the spectrum, reduction of sodium, fats, sugars, because in, in reality, the mainstream underbelly of the economic spectrum of consumers is eating those kind of foods every day and not shopping Whole Foods. So what, what kind of work are you guys doing in that area? So I mean, I'll kick off since yeah. I think I did probably the most in kind of the yeah. CPG space. But um, I'm a big fan of free from if it's natural. 
So I don't mm -hmm. like overly engineered foods as the core of our business. I think that's what Big Siege PG has been doing for years. And the less processed, the most, more minimally processed, the more nutrient dense we can have our food supply be, the better our, our, our world will be, the better our consumers will be. Um, so if I look at Kind Bars, right, which is a great business, rapidly growing, it's gluten free, naturally. Right? It doesn't have gluten in it because the ingredients don't contain gluten. That's great for people who need to follow a gluten-free diet. It's an, a natural product that's available for that. I think as we try to over-engineer allergy-free products, we end up taking something out of them. And so I think we need to be thoughtful and cautious about that. Um, if you have you know, an allergy, you should eat the apple chips and banana chips that we're trying to sort mm -hmm. of bridge the gap from getting fresh produce but make it shelf-stable, available, affordable, and convenient. Um, let's bake the apple chips. They're still nutrient dense. We can reduce food waste because we're taking perishable item and turning it into a longer shelf life item. You know, it's not perfect. We'd rather eat an apple, but having something that's nutrient dense and, and offers a free from, at, you know, advantage without um, being overly engineered is sort of my goal as an investor. I think we need to be a little bit careful as well though when we start talking about you know engineered food because every piece of food that we're eating on this planet has been engineered and we wouldn't be here unless it was engineered. We would not be able to support the amount of life that we have on this planet currently. So I think that we need to be very careful about villainizing quote-unquote engineered food um, because we've been engineering it for a really really long time and I think as soon as we start you know, villainizing, you know, as soon as our marketing turns to we're not en engineered food, um, that is disinformation that's getting uh, kicked back to the consumer. And then we're forcing people to make choices just based on free from this because this is what I heard the marketing spin say that I shouldn't have. I need to stay not, you know, next thing we're going to have is non engineered food. And what does that even mean, right? There's not even any FDA guidance on what natural actually means. So there's a lot of misleading information out there. And it's a really, really hard thing to do to educate a population about what they should be putting in their bodies when we don't even have the longitudinal studies to really support, um, you know, to support any of those, those facts. And we see these things changing all the time. So I, I, you know, I think we as a company always think about how we can be very forthcoming with information about exactly what it is we're doing and not just hide behind you know, free from this or free from this as the, as the latest kind of fad. And maybe just to add into that, you know, so agree with a lot of the comments that were made already too, but I, I do think supply chain is really important. So everybody's way busier uh, than they've been before. That's part of the reason why they're kind of snacking mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. finding a way to solve getting fresh product, which is kind of the freest from everything to people in a costly way um, so they can have it when they want it and they, they kind of don't have the time to go get it effectively. So I really love kind of what you're up to, I think is the key. Mm -hmm. um, so I think looking at the the snacks that are engineered and, and kind of do work and aren't harmful and, and spending time on that I think is, is a good use of time but also figuring out how do we get the fresh product to people in different delivery mechanisms quicker and faster but it's a hard problem to solve because it, it's you know low margin and takes a lot of capital and, and, and make it snackable that, I think that's one yeah. thing I mean just fresh produce make it snackable right they've done studies where they you know put put students in college in a room and told them they're going to do some other experiment and they left them there either with whole apples or with apple slices and they, you know, they, they count how many apple slices they eat or, or whole apples and they eat seven times the number of apple slices mm -hmm. than they eat the apple. They don't want to commit to the full apple but you know, yeah, they'll have a couple <laughs> apple slices. So you, know, you think about just simple things like that um, and how that could impact you know, just, just ch children nutrition um, and, and, and that's you know, where I think we could get a lot of extra mileage about the things we're already doing about you know, looking at those type of um, consumer <laughs> behaviors as they relate to the, the form that the, pr the food is presented in. I want to, oh, okay, we'll do one more. One last comment on protein. Uh, I happen to raise a very unique breed of pig. And what I found is with the mangalitsa versus the kamadi pig, which we've improved over all these years, which we've gotten to taste just like chicken, which means you, the only thing you taste is the stuff you put on top of it. <laughs> you can't eat uh, a half as much a portion of my pork as you can of beef or of, of kamadi pork because of the satiety factor uh, of, of, of the, the lusciousness of the fat and the, and the basic natural flavors of it. And I think that's one of the one things that we're missing in the panel here is trying to drive some of the stuff that's out there that we take for granted and think it is natural, but we gotta start driving it back towards hmm. where the pigs are raised outside. Yeah. And you don't have to take vitamin D. Yeah. The vitamin yeah. D is in the back fat of my pig, yeah. okay? Um, you know, just 
basic things like this where we've gotten so far off track we don't remember where it came from. Yeah. Ryan, can I comment on that real quick? Sure. Because I think it illustrates um, a really interesting uh, dichotomy that's happening in food tech is you have two, <coughs> two opposite ends of the spectrum that are happening. Yes. You have fundamental science and you have craft production. Um, we're very much on the craft production side, you know, networked um, supply. Um, and so I, that, I would love to um, talk to you. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that there's also a place for the core science innovation as well. So I think all of these together really work hand in hand. Well, and, and so first I'd like to commend you for what you're doing. And the reason for that is what we're really lacking in the food system today, from, in my humble opinion, is biodiversity. We're eating this same yeah. mm -hmm. seed uh, of tomato. It doesn't matter where you are around the country. It doesn't matter if that's you know, being grown in a low yield area, whatever it is. We really are lacking biodiversity, and I think what you're doing, at least you know, in the protein space, that you can expand that into fresh fruits and vegetables as well. And I, I think that if we have more of a focus on not just growing you know, the seed that we've been provided with, but actually cultivating our own cultivars, we can get new properties that we never even thought were possible. Just the pig behind there and hurt. Well, <laughs> A rescued pig. A rescued pig. That's where you find the good ones. I, yeah. I want to just say, because we're, we're, we're bumping up against the end of time, that um, the real reason I wanted to put this panel together today, and thank you for making the time to come, was trying to tease out. It seems like there's clearly a lot of increased consumer interest in the food in food and the food they eat, um, and there's a flurry of investment activity. And I've heard from investors who are completely new to the space, We're like, oh, I'm all about food now. And so it was making me nervous. Is this a fad? Is this silly capital? Um, or uh, should we have hope that we're actually about to make some real progress in fixing a broken food system? And I think you guys have helped answer that, at least for me. I feel inspired. I feel like just with the folks up here, um, we can make real progress against um, some of these issues. Thank you. Um, I think all of our panelists will stick around outside and, um, and uh, take some questions. Thanks.